Good evening, everybody. I'm Darian Kath. Uh, I'm a park ranger in Knife River Indian Village's National Historic Site, uh, right in the, the heart of North Dakota. And um, glad to see some familiar faces and uh, see some familiar names on the participant list today. Um, it's been a while, um, so I'm kind of the, the prodigal son of, of Lewis and Clark, you know, coming back and being able to do some presenting to you today. Um, I don't get a huge amount of chance to, to do Lewis and Clark stuff here, but, um, but for those of you who don't know me, um, I've been here about three years now. Uh, previously, I was working at the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center in uh, Great Falls, Montana for um, over seven years. But uh, I'm here now as an uh, interpretive specialist for the Na National Park Service at uh, Knight River Indian Villages. And um, just a little bit about uh, the, the park itself. Um, it was established in 1974. It uh, is comprised of a couple of the historic village sites, um, three at least of the Hidatsa people. And uh, these village sites are the ancestral homelands for those Hidatsa people. So it's a, it's a privilege tonight uh, for me to be able to share their culture and uh, history with you. And on that note, um, I'm gonna dive into a little bit of uh, what the five villages are in this area and uh, kind of the, what in terms of Lewis and Clark when they were here, but um, kind of give you a precursor of that too, to, to kind of uh, flesh it out as far as how these five villages came to be. Now, the, as far as the village sites go, um, we've got a couple within park boundaries, and then I'll show you later on, there's a couple of the Mandan villages that are, are lost to history. But in any case, um, we'll do some questions at the end. Uh, all I ask is that uh, there's no Chicago Wea questions. If you want to debate that, you're going to come here on site, and uh, and and we'll do it mano y mano that way. So, <laughs> um, other than that, um, the it's a pleasure for me to be presenting tonight. Um, I know it's the the Ida Johnson lecture series and. Uh, and uh, dearly miss Ida, um, she came to me during that uh, time when I was working in Great Falls and asked me to do uh, some presentations for the, the PRC. And so I did one on Chicago Wea and the crossing the Bitterroots and a couple other different topics. So happy to be able to, to have Ida in spirit tonight uh, presenting with you to th this evening. Other than that, I, I did want to mention um, uh, Don Peterson as well, who, who was a great mentor for me um, in my time in Great Falls. So getting into uh, this Earth Lodge here, no, this isn't a background filter. Um, I'm actually in an Earth Lodge. Uh, we have a reconstructed Earth Lodge on site here, and it gives the, the visitors who come, come here a chance to uh, be inside a structure uh, that's pretty much historically accurate to uh, what was here when the villages were active and occupied. Uh, I end up um, doing quite a few school group virtual visits uh, just last week, one in Missouri. And so we do have some modern updates, as you can see, uh, lights. Um, I've got a motorized uh, window over our smoke hole uh, we're wired for electricity, and of course, me being able to broadcast you to you tonight, um, we are wired in uh, internet and so on. But uh, just to prove my point here, I can walk all the way back here. And uh, now I'm about 30 feet away from you. So I'm we'll close. in here, that'll give you a little bit of perspective as far as the, uh, the size of this. Uh, this was built pretty much as an average earth lodge uh, for the average family back then. So this is gonna be about 38 feet in diameter. 
Uh, this one, I think took about nine months to construct with a uh, whole construction crew, but uh, women living back then, um, a couple centuries ago, would be able to uh, put this together in a matter of uh, about two weeks. Uh, there's about 200 trees that go into constructing an earth lodge like this, uh, starting with, in some cases, pushing some dirt aside, uh, erecting the four main posts, uh, notching those in with the beams overhead, and then working on an outside ring of posts, about a dozen of those uh, beams as well. And then as you can see, pointed out here, we've got uh, side walls that are in place. And then as we look up, we've got our rafter poles, and of course the smoke hole. And over top of those rafters, there is about six inches of packed willow branches. Oh, God. Top, top that is about, uh, oh, I'd say two feet of uh, marsh grass and then um, all that earth. So there is an insulating layer in here of about uh, 12, at least 12 inches. And uh, that's what keeps this thing pretty much air conditioned all year long. So right now, it's, it's a fantastic evening out there. It's mid 60s, uh, no wind. And uh, here I'm kind of freezing in about 40 degrees <laughs> in the Earth Lodge tonight. But uh, this was uh, first constructed in 1994. So it's um, about half its life cycle is, is uh, what the engineers had initially designed it for. Um, this would last about 50 years. We do have a plastic or a rubber envelope that um, keeps this thing from, from leaking. And uh, it's pretty maintenance free um, other than that. Um, it's been, I think, uh, resodded once. Um, the stringer posts that are on the outside were replaced once due to rot. But uh, other than that, this thing um, lasts five times longer than, than the original. With an original lodge would last only about 10 years. And uh, the failing point being the, the cottonwood timbers. Um, cottonwood, you know, as a wood tends to uh, degrade rather quickly. So this does have cottonwood for the four main posts, but the outside timbers, um, we've got some cedar, got some pine, um, just whatever lumber that was available to the, uh, the contractor, the construction crew at the time they built this. Uh, as of, I think, 2015, we did have a dirt floor in here. Um, it did get poured into concrete, but like I always say, um, 10 years of walking around in this thing and a dirt floor would be as pretty much as hard as concrete. Uh, they did uh, tend to sweep these out a lot and uh, once a month do a, a thorough cleaning of the lodge. And other than that, um, we do have a full suite of uh, different props and that kind of materials, um, items on display. That would be um, here in Everyday Earth Lodge. And uh, other than that, it's, it's a very useful interpretive tool. Um, right next door, we've got the gardens and that type of thing, and then the visitor center. So, so with these earth lodges, um, one thing to, to keep in mind is during the uh, course of the presentation tonight is the amount of resources that go into constructing one of these earth lodges and the length of time of occupation within these villages here. So in selecting a site, you have to manage that site uh, wisely so you'll be able to sustain your re resources for a couple centuries. And uh, as you'll find out, that's the case in, in a lot of these village sites um, that we're going to go through tonight. So um, just a quick housekeeping thing. 
you'll see me uh, going back and forth. Uh, my camera is at a wide angle here. Um, it's actually a document camera so that um, if I need to, I can just basically put a artifact or, or something like that. Like I said, I do a lot of school groups. So I'm constantly going back and forth with, with that. So um, other than that, I wanted to start out with uh, how these villages came to be. It was a precursor of uh, many other villages that happened to be uh, down river from here. And since we are talking about the Mandan and Hidatsa people tonight, um, I wanted to take a look at a slide like this. And as you can see this, I like maps a lot. So this map uh, shows you Basically, um, a lot of the archeological sites um, that are still around today, in some cases, uh, some of the village areas, but um, gives you a, a broad scope of the population and the density that was here um, roughly around the uh, 1500s into the 1600s and 1700s. You know, with these uh, Mandan villages, particularly um, down around the Hart River, uh, those are some of the earlier Mandan villages as they, they migrate to this area in and around the 1100s. And, and so you can see them lining the Missouri River from uh, the Hart River. So keep in mind the mouth of the Hart River is right around where today the, the city of Mandan is and then Bismarck being across the uh, river from that. And then as you progress um, up river, you're getting to um, some of those other sites. Of course, uh, one is still around today as a state historic site that's uh, Double Ditch, which is kind of a misnomer because it's pretty much quadruple ditch when we uh, start to get into uh, the fortification around that site. Uh, as we move up river, um, actually where it says river on this, uh, we're kind of missing a site called Molander. But uh, then we keep getting up um, into that Painted Woods district and a, a lot of village sites um, popped up around that area. Uh, you can see that Green Shield site that was uh, an offshoot of the Arikara that uh, came up for a time around the uh, 1790s. And then uh, we finally were moving up river to Mahaha. Keep that one in mind as you're looking at it. That's an important site when it comes to, uh, to the five villages because um, this predates the five villages. Mahaha and uh, White Buffalo Robe, those two sites. And uh, White Buffalo Robe, by the way, um, we find out about that one through the letters of uh, Clark and, and Biddle. As they're writing back and forth, um, Biddle's got his long laundry list of questions. And, uh, and so Clark is going through them the best, best he can. And as we know, he eventually turns things over to George Shannon to help out, but... Um, but that site there, White Buffalo Robe, uh, it's named after the chief, but um, there was a time between Molander and, uh, and the village of Amahami where, where it was either Mahaha or White Buffalo Robe. In any case, um, the original site for the Hidatsa tribe in this area, as we get all the way up to the corner of that is right up there called Lower Hidatsa. And then um, less than 100 years later, uh, the, the big Hidatsa village uh, starts up. So we're talking in terms of uh, around the 1500s with Lower Hidatsa, uh, early 1500s, 
from an, at least a, a current archaeological standpoint. You know, with uh, their origin story, uh, Lower Hidatsa, that was uh, occupied by the Awatiha subgroup of Hidatsas, and um, their, their origin stories go back to a fellow named Flaming Arrow, who uh, basically uh, came down out of the clouds um, and, and hit the earth in, in a flaming, fiery process and uh, started the original Awatiha Hidatsas. And so that's um, Flaming Arrow. I, I'm not seeing that uh, as a site. It's, it's an actual village um, site today too, but it's not listed on, on there now that I see that. But anyways, this, um, this whole region and what makes um, Knife River a National Historic Site is that uh, at least for the, the park and its boundaries has some of the best preserved uh, Earth Lodge village areas um, anywhere along the, the upper plains here. And from a larger perspective, it represents uh, the, the heartland of trade for the Northern Plains. And so each one of these sites was a, a vibrant community uh, that would be hosting tribes from anywhere, north, south, east, west, you name it, um, people coming in to, uh, to trade, especially during the fall when, um, when the corn harvest and uh, other vegetables were, were coming in to, to harvest. So moving from there, we get into, well, let me move back for a second because there was uh, this, time where we did have smallpox and it started around the 1780s, uh, early 1780s. And from the best uh, of what I could find out, starts out in the Spanish Southwest, moves up through tribes eventually to the Shoshone, and then moves east from there. And uh, once it hits the, the middle Missouri, upper Missouri region here, um, it's just devastating effects all around. And it's something where you have um, Arikara villages um, south of this map, uh, up to a dozen or more Arikara villages get reduced to uh, what it was by the time Lewis and Clark saw them, which was only around two or three. And for the Mandan, you're seeing all those villages there uh, double Ditch being an example, um, all these um, individual bands of, of Mandans get reduced down to two or three villages. Now the Hidatsas fared the best out of, out of all these um, different Earth Lodge tribes. Um, if I had to venture a guess, it was because of their, their nomadic nature at this point. And, um, and so that was a double-edged sword when it came to smallpox, because um, if you were a nomadic tribe, you fared better. And, um, and that's eventually what uh, brought a power struggle into the region. Even more so, it exacerbated it, because uh, the Sioux, different bands of Sioux, were able to, uh, to come in and, and dominate these Earth Lodge villages. And so a lot of them met their demise by, uh, by both those factors. So it, it can't be overstated the, the devastation of smallpox that hit uh, between 1780 and, and 1782. And um, you're gonna see a reoccurrence of that when I get into uh, a little more into the, the five villages themselves. So moving on from there, um, we're getting into the 1790s. And um, there was still a lot of chaos, a lot of fluctuation between the, the, uh, the different tribes. And uh, there happened to be a, a Spanish-led exploration coming up river. But it wasn't necessarily led by Spaniards. 
Um, it might have been sanctioned by Carlos IV, but uh, in reality, it came down to an, an Englishman working previously for the Northwest Company uh, named Alexander McKay and a Welshman by the name of John Evans. And uh, during that expedition, leaving St. Louis and then uh, getting up to Fort Charles, and uh, for those of you Lewis and Clark scholars, um, that is listed on one of Clark's maps as a, a deserted post. But um, McKay ends up staying there and Evans continues northward and eventually arrives at the Mandan villages. And uh, he's got a, a personal agenda as well. He's trying to figure out if the Mandans are part of the, the long lost uh, Welsh that had come over at some point and um, getting into that doctrine of discovery and, and some of those other um, topics there. So Evans uh, does create some maps and, uh, and along with McKay and uh, those are eventually uh, handed over as copies to Lewis and Clark who have those available at the time of the expedition actually meet with McKay at some point uh, in 1803, I think. But um, as you can see uh, from the map here, we're looking at, yes, um, it, it's gonna be hard to pick out here, but Wanataris and Mandans, when you find that and you see the little, little knife river flowing in, the solid dots are Hidatsa villages, and then the, um, the open dots are Mandan villages. And you'll notice there that um, one of those open dots is among the Hidatsas. So there was a time when um, there were some Mandans living uh, right here, um, no more than a quarter mile away from, from where I'm standing. Uh, but but mostly Hidatsas in this region. So in any case, um, the, the object of the, the Evans expedition was to get to the Pacific in return. And uh, when you start reading on their instructions, it's, it sounds eerily familiar to, uh, to Lewis and Clark and uh, Jefferson's instructions. However, it uh, remained there. Um, Evans returned in, in uh, 1797, back down to St. Louis. Um, he found as he went down, Fort Charles had been already vacated by McKay and, and uh, he continued down. Uh, one of the other purposes, by the way, for, for that expedition was to drive the British out. So a name that you'll recognize that uh, is familiar with Lewis and Clark and comes up from time to time is uh, Rene Jassam. And Jassam actually had a post um, since 1794, at least, in and around uh, one of the Mandan villages. And we don't actually find out um, what happened to his post. Um, presumably, I'm, I'm thinking Evans and, and his men burn it down. But uh, Rene Jussam remains in the area, uh, takes up residence in uh, one of the lodges and uh, becomes an interpreter later on for, for Lewis and Clark. Now, we get into 1796. So Evans is still around, but uh, there is a fellow that moves into one of the Hidatsa villages, the, the Awatia village and uh, his name's Toussaint Charbonneau. So we'll just uh, keep that as a, a place marker as well. But uh, within a year and December of 1797, a fellow by the name of David Thompson, he gets uh, tasked with getting the longitude and latitude of the villages because now it's become a strategic point for the, the Northwest Company at least. And, um, and with more frequent visitors coming down to trade, um, we see that coming in around 1785 
and then it just keeps precipitating and, and ramping up from there. So Thompson coming down um, does this map, the, uh, the Big Bend in the Missouri. And with the Big Bend, um, it's actually up a little farther uh, with uh, the Missouri River anyways, but I've honed in on uh, the, the five villages here. And we can see Big Hidatsa, um, the Awatiha village sites. So I kind of put that in parentheses because there's, um, there's two distinct village sites and it gets a little murky between those two. But you'll notice that um, I've listed them also uh, upriver from Big Hidatsa on the Missouri as uh, 31 houses and seven tents. Uh, it's probably a winter village that uh, he, he encountered. And as you can see, his, his route is coming down from the, uh, the northwest and then kind of sideswiping the Missouri and eventually leaving from the Mandans. And, and you'll see that uh, pointer right at Little Lake. So this was a time um, of about 20 days in December and January of 1798 as well. So um, the Awatia villages, and then you see those two Mandan villages that are well established by the time uh, Lewis and Clark arrive a, a few years later. So Mitutanko, Ruptari, uh, ones that, that will come to know well. Now, um, he doesn't actually go to the, the Arikara village. So you see a Pawnee village of 300 warriors. Um, so it's actually placed, I think, on the, the wrong side of the river. Um, but in any case, it is right around where, where Washburn is today. And from an archeological standpoint, it's known as the, the Green Shield site. So um, what do we have happening in late September of 1804? Someone can take themselves off of mute and let me know. September, late September. 1894. 1804. Yep, we're looking at maybe around, memory serves me right, September 25th, 26th, 27th of 1804. Anybody? Yeah, the Knife River encounter or the Bad River encounter. There we go. So we've got uh, the Teton Sioux encounter there. And uh, that's going to be a little bit of foreshadowing with, as it goes with, um, with what will be to come as far as trying to smooth out diplomatic relations uh, between the, the five villages. So in essence, Lewis and Clark are, are trying to muddle their way through uh, decades, centuries of different uh, relations that have an ebb and flow to them with these tribes. Um, the Arikara at, uh, at that time was, or at least when Lewis and Clark met them, uh, did want to establish a peace with the, the Mandans and Hidatsas. Otherwise, uh, before then, they were um, enemies to, to those two tribes. Uh, the Sioux, of course. And then you have um, the Sioux um, kind of getting aggressive towards the Arikara. Um, the Arikara, in turn, get aggressive to the, the Mandans and Hidatsas. So there's a lot of um, nuances and, uh, and things that Lewis and Clark, you know, they're only there for, for a winter, and so they can't see the, the whole scope of things. And they've got their, their uh, speech in mind that they're going to give for, um, for diplomacy. So um, they're getting into some times, in a, and I picked out a couple examples here, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. 
so let's go back to the five villages here. So they're getting into this area in and around late October of 1804. And with that, they're gonna get Fort Mandan established. But um, before Fort Mandan was selected as a site, uh, they're camping in various locations. Um, and as you can see on the, the east side of the Missouri there, we've got Mandan village number two. Remember Lewis and Clark keep things simple here. So it's village one, two, three, four, five. And um, we're on Mandan village number two, a little north of there. They're selecting an area to uh, attempt a, a council. And this would be September or October, excuse me, 28th through the 31st. Um, it doesn't really go all that well. They do have one Arikara chief along. And of course, uh, Joseph Gravelins being the, the interpreter for him. Uh, he's going to try and make a peace with the Mandans and Hidatsas. And I think we do have the chief from Amahami, um, white buffalo robe unfolded. He's present as well as uh, Black Cat. And it was a terrible day to begin with because it was terribly windy and, uh, and they didn't really get off to a good start. And to, to put an emphasis on that um, diplomacy, so the council doesn't go over all that well, but um, they're back at camp and actually they're starting to construct Fort Mandan and Black Cat comes over by himself and, and he's got his own agenda. So each village um, is, is autonomous unto itself in some cases. So the other point that, that can be made here is that uh, the Hidatsas, uh, right from the get-go, largely ignore Lewis and Clark, or, or at least are suspicious of their intentions. And we'll find out that uh, a lot later when, um, when we do have uh, Charles McKenzie and, and Larocque and, and what they leave behind in their writings. So Lewis, as, as I mentioned with uh, the Hidatsas ignoring um, any attempt to, uh, to have a council together, Lewis and six others in November of um, 1804, the 25th, 26th, actually venture out and, um, and visit these, these villages. So a little bit of uh, placement here. Um, Lewis is actually traveling on land. Um, others are by boat, but uh, Lewis has in tow both Druillard and uh, Jassam and Charbonneau as interpreters. And uh, he reaches um, the Amahami village and then uh, gets to Black Moccasin, uh, that village there. So that is um, the Awatiha village. And then later on, um, quite sure if he makes it all the way up to Big Hidatsa. We'll get to Laborn in a little bit. But in any case, he, he may, at least makes an attempt to, uh, to meet with some of these other chiefs and, and prominent figures of the villages. So that same day, we do have that the Northwest Company arrive. And uh, actually, if you read the journal entry for that day, uh, Lewis does meet with Larock and spends about 15 minutes talking to him on his way to one of the villages. Uh, they cross paths. So remember, this is a this is a whole community right here that um, I'm guessing everybody knew everybody, you know, in each village. And uh, you've got a population of around 2,500 people at least. Um, you put it all together. And so, you know, like I said, it's a, they were autonomous to themselves, but, but uh, looking from a larger picture, you, you know, it's a whole small community here with uh, everybody knowing everybody else. 
So the Northwest Company are, are going to be there for the winter, um, spending time with Lewis and Clark, uh, La Rock especially. And uh, as you go through some of the journal, you can find a, a whole realm of cast of characters when it comes to the, the Canadians, uh, whether it be Hugh McCracken or Hugh Henney, um, Charles McKenzie and La Rock, and... Um, and just a lot of outside activity that uh, continues to come into the, the villages here. And for the most part, welcomed uh, with open arms. Um, it, it isn't until March 9th when we finally get uh, Le Bourne to come down. And so that's with these, village, with these villages and how they go. Um, you can look at it, the reason maybe why Fort Mandan was selected as a site, uh, it goes in kind of order of, of aggressiveness for one, because uh, you've got pretty much um, that first village, Big White, as, as we all know, is more of a peaceful uh, chief. And there's a couple other uh, chiefs and, and elders in that village, but for the most part, it, it's the most peaceful of all these villages. And then it just kind of builds up from there where we get into Ruptari, um, the Amahami village, which is the subset of, of Hidatsas known as the Awahawis. And I actually personally find them um, the most fascinating out of all these uh, villages and, and groups of people because anybody coming in from the outside um, immediately recognizes them as, as a tribe unto themselves. And they do have uh, a long sorted history with, uh, you know, even fighting amongst other Hidatsas, especially uh, the ones for lack of a better term in big Hidatsa called the Hidatsa proper. Um, they, end up being uh, the distinct people unto themselves. And um, something I'm looking at uh, building upon and uh, potentially putting an article out for publication in, in uh, WPO um, on that, that village site. And then as you get up into that Minotauri village, so that's number four, Black Moccasin. Uh, that's the one where you've got some of those uh, folks around uh, maybe the summer of 1799, 1800, somewhere in there, going all the way out and, and uh, conducting a raid against the Shoshones, uh, capturing some and bringing some back, uh, one being Sacagawea, the other being Otter Woman, and um, rest is history there. And then we get to that fifth village site and uh, Le Bourne, pretty much ruling the, the village with an iron fist. Um, when you read the accounts of Le Bourne, um, some would say that if you wanted to classify him from a psychological standpoint, he would kind of be a sociopath. Um, he was quite, could be quite a violent character although there, there were times where he did show, um, oh, some hesitation, I guess, in, uh, in doing violence. But in any case, uh, he is the most prominent chief uh, at the time that, that uh, Lewis and Clark are in the area. Uh, he'll eventually get ousted and exiled out of his village and and create a smaller village with uh, some of his immediate clan um, a few miles away. So maybe like five lodges in about 1812 time period. And, uh, and then he eventually gets killed by another chief of the Big Hidatsa village. I think they, they finally had enough of him after a while. But, but anyways, that's, that's the story on Le Bourne. I put this together and I hope this shows up all right um, as far as the, the text on this one. It's basically an overlay to show you some of those uh, finer points 
from a, a topographical standpoint, as well as uh, the river. I think I got this river channel of 1804 from the, um, the online interactive atlas, uh, Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail has. And then um, looking at those specific village sites today, um, you can see, let's go for Big Hidatsa right away. Um, the Knife River, it's hard to actually see that uh, other than the original channel, but uh, the Knife River at, at that point um, doesn't change a whole lot, but you can see that course of the Missouri changed extensively uh, from 1804 to now. Um, Amahami, you know, the, the mouth of the Knife River actually changes around um, because it's kind of in the backwaters of the, the main channel of the Missouri. Uh, you can see that main channel actually shifted all the way over and uh, you've got a whole floodplain in between in between that today. And then uh, Ruptari, um, I have it listed as earlier. So in 1804, it was on one side of the Missouri. When Lewis and Clark returned in 1806, it's on the other side. Uh, there must have been a, a falling out that, that took place in 1805. And so that village actually uh, switches to the other side of the river. Uh, Mittitonka would eventually, um, as we get later in the, in the 1800s, uh, basically move to where Fort Clark is. It kind of keeps moving its way down. And once Fort Clark is established uh, among many other uh, smaller posts during the, the early 1800s, um, they'll eventually reside right next to, to Fort Clark or vice versa, if you want to look at it that way. Or vice versa. That too. <laughs> and I think this uh, image was listed as uh, Black Cat's Village. So uh, Lewis and Clark and the expedition spending the winter here uh, were constantly um, having visitors to the fort and uh, hosting different visitors. And since Fort Mandan uh, was on the same side of the river as, as Black Cat, um, I'm thinking that there was a higher visitation of uh, villagers from this, this village than there were, was from uh, Big White's village, which was across the river, even though they were closer in proximity. So a typical Mandan village right there. Um, you know, like I keep saying, a lot of activity. You've got a high population density in a very close uh, quarters. And um, you've got folks up on top of the lodges, which was a, a common scene. Um, I think Alexander Henry, who was uh, in 1806, a couple weeks just before the expedition arrived back in the area. And uh, we were in June, July of uh, 1806. And he remarked that uh, about 50 people could stand up on top of an earth lodge. So, so they are well constructed. Um, other than that, you can see that uh, in this artist rendering, um, the drying rack kind of central to the, the illustration with uh, some, some women cutting some squash. And then on the other side of that earth lodge, you're looking into that central plaza and uh, within that central plaza, just kind of visible is the Ark of the Lone Man, uh, most sacred part of the village in terms of the Mandan. So I did want to throw this one in too. We've got uh, that first meeting with uh, the Charbonneau family coming down while uh, Fort Mandan is being constructed. And uh, Charbonneau, you know, bottom line, he's an opportunist. Um, he's 
it's what's best for Charbonneau. And, and that's the way I've kind of looked at him. I've, you know, done a lot of research of, of him over the years and, and uh, conclude, um, you know, he's going to take the best deal where it comes around. And uh, so he was doing some, some mood, moonlighting with the, uh, the Northwest company um, under the approval of, of Lewis and Clark during that whole winter. And let's see what else I got. Ah, so the Clark Maximilian map um, showing those five villages and uh, in relation to Fort Mandan. And right there, um, where, let's see, of course, we're, we're reading Clark's writing here, his, his nice handwriting. Actually, this, the handwriting on the maps is, is pretty good compared to the journals. Um, you've got the Maha village, um, so that's Amahami. That's kind of at the, the mouth of the Knife, Knife River. Uh, Metaharda, so that's that next one up. Um, I'm going to show you that one, at least an artist uh, perspective uh, in 1832. Show you that in a minute. And then uh, right up at the, the bend of that Knife River, the Minotara village. And uh, that's Big Hedatsa. So keep in mind, um, Lewis and Clark's names for for these villages are based off of uh, the Mandan or what they could translate from the Mandan, um, so Mandan names. So like a, a village like Amahami, um, you might, in reading your journal, uh, come to see that as uh, Watasoons, they're referred to, or the Shoe Indians. Um, so a lot of names with the, the Awahawi group there, right at the mouth of the knife. And uh, other than that, I did want to show you that, uh, that village. So there is the Sakakawea site. Um, that's what we know it as today. Uh, give, her, give her a little credit on that because uh, that's where she lived uh, along with the rest of the Charbonneau family, both before and after the Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, the village sits on a prominent high bank of the Knife River. And uh, just like that Mandan illustration I showed you, a lot of activity going on, uh, people swimming and uh, people going around in a bull boat and uh, a lively, vibrant place that was uh, overseen by a a very prominent uh, chief, and you see him illustrated there. Uh, that's Black Moccasin. So almost 30 years after Lewis and Clark, um, he's he's still around. And um, I don't know if anybody knows the, the age of Black Moccasin at the time he was painted by George Catlin. If you do, you can chime in. Actually, I do this one with the school school kids a lot too. Um, at the time of his uh, portrait here, he was uh, purported to be 102 years old. So being born circa 1730, and uh, he's still active in the mind, um, quite feeble from a physical perspective, but uh, still very active in the mind. And actually he um, ends up telling George Catlin at the time to, to give his regards to, to Clark when he gets back to St. Louis. So um, with Lewis and Clark being here, it, it ends up being kind of a diplomatic stalemate. So they get back here in, in August of 1806 and they do their best to try and get uh, some, some chiefs back to, to visit Jefferson. And as we know how it plays out, um, LeBourne is, is hesitant to do so, even though they offer him a, a swivel gun and, and have a great ceremony and that type of thing. Uh, the rest are, are hesitant to, to get anywhere where they're, they're going into the Sioux country, um, at least with Big White, you know, as we know how the, the story unfolds there. Um, him, his wife, along with uh, Jusam and his wife, um, 
accept that invitation and, and head down river with Lewis and Clark and the expedition in, in the fall of 1806. So that's the five villages with Lewis and Clark. Um, what they look like today, I'm gonna show you a, a quick example here. Um, some of you may have not visited this site before. I urge you to come out and do so. But if you're not able to, um, at least in studying the five villages, um, you might come across an aerial view of the villages today. And they look something like this. So here's that uh, village, what it looks like today versus uh, the one I just showed you in 1832. Uh, the depressions, they're about the size of what I'm standing in right now. Um, over time, a lot of that uh, dirt from the top of the lodge erodes down and uh, pools at the base of the lodge and creates those depressions. And this village today has uh, lost about at least uh, 10 to 15% of the original lodges. So if you visit the site today, this section here is actually trail, an artificial bank that was put in. Um, it's, it's off limits to uh, public right now because right here is the original bank. And there is continually artifacts that are coming and sloughing off the side of the bank. So we're at this point getting that uh, bank stabilized. And once that's stabilized, uh, can reopen this lower section of the trail. But a uh, fascinating area where, um, where you can walk in the footsteps of uh, Lewis and Clark and uh, Sacagawea and the rest. So that is uh, the five villages tonight. Um, I don't know if we have uh, time to open it up for a few questions. Yes, we do. So if everybody would like to unmute, and if you have a question, uh, go ahead and ask it to Darian. You know, I just did a little math, Darian. Each of those villages, if it's 38 foot in diameter, roughly, that's 1,100 square feet. That's a good size, good size home. Yeah, and when you're looking at it from uh, these villages right here, um, within walking distance, had between 40 and 50 lodges. A um, couple miles up the road, you're in that big Hidatsa site. Um, I didn't mention this before, but uh, you probably saw it on one of the maps um, where it had over 100 lodges. And so, so quite an area. Um, and uh, most of those lodges are, are still visible today, especially up at Big Hidatsa, they're, they're quite prominent. You know, they were noted in that area for their agriculture. Could you just briefly touch on that? Yeah, sure. Um, I mentioned with, with this uh, trade and, uh, and it was, um, you know, kind of that double-edged sword again, where you have um, a semi-sedentary lifestyle that you can be able to, uh, to grant, uh, plant and, and grow crops. And if on an average year, there was quite a surplus. Um, and if you had a little extra rainfall, even more so. So uh, one feature in the lodge here is actually the cash pit. And uh, you can see that hole in the floor there. And there was one of those in every lodge and there was at least, oh, three or four dug on outside the lodge. And so those would be all full. And to give you, a, for instance, um, a village that I didn't even show on the map, Huff Indian Village, um, down south of the, the Hart River. Uh, the estimates go, I think, um, over 70, um, what is it again? 25,000 bushels um, when you add up all the cash pits that are within that site. Uh, the storage capacity gets, gets to be um, tens of thousands of bushels worth. Did you also talk briefly about what kind of crops they grew? 
So uh, beans, corn, squash, um, we grow them here on site as close as the varieties um, as possible that we can find. Actually, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Lee, because um, I've got an exciting sample of corn this year that I'll be growing at home in my personal garden to, uh, to get more of the seed stock. But, uh, but in looking at uh, the accession record of where it came from out of this um, USDA seed bank, it actually came straight out of a cash pit um, it, during an archeological excavation, probably in 1971. It ended up at the seed bank, exchanged about three hands, but ended up there in 1993. And uh, I reached out to them and got a sample of it. So we're um, within a year gonna have corn that was actually grown right here in the villages and uh, be closest genetically to what they had. So corn um, and then the beans, uh, there's several varieties that you can grow in your home garden, like uh, yellow aricara, uh, red hidatsa, uh, hidatsa shield figure. And we do all those varieties. And then uh, the squash, we do both aricara and mandan. Uh, this year I've got um, the mandan squash are probably about this big. They're a real early season one. And, uh, and if you are able to travel this way sometime in uh, over the course of the summer, right outside the Earth Lodge here are gonna be uh, hopefully some really nice gardens uh, full of some of those examples. I think Dwayne had a question. I do. Yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself, Dwayne. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me? Yep. 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 Awesome. First off, Darren, it is really good to see you, my friend. Um, so I'm thinking of, uh, so Krizat, I think it was the somewhere around the first of our October, the fourth of October is in my mind. I think he comes running back into the camp. He has left his gun. He's left his tomahawk uh, because he's ran into some creature that has uh, scared the life out of him. So in the maps that we've looked at here tonight, did I look upon the area where that probably happened or was this a little premature? You know, I think it's premature because I thought their first encounter happened somewhere around Culbertson today. It is now Culbertson. Yeah. Time. So that is true. That was the first encounter. That's the one that Lewis ends up killing. But so nobody else sees this bear. It's not for sure whether even, you know, it was a bear. It's just something caused Cruzat to uh, run off and leave his tomahawk and his gun. They would go back later to retrieve them, you but it, it was sure. before they got to Mandan, I think. Cause, yes, because there are, they do see signs that at some point of, you know, some paws that are, are bigger than the average bear of what they're used to. And yeah, yeah. that does occur before they, they even get to the villages here. So that was before we even got at the maps that we were looking at. Yeah. And then okay. over the course of that winter, yeah. they're hearing the, those uh, stories of, um, of these gigantic bears. And uh, as you like to do with your program, um, you know, I'd, I'd rather fight you know, hunting, Got it. Uh, rather than one grizzly bear or something to that effect. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Hey, thanks, Darian, man. This was great. It's so good to see you. It's so good to listen to you. Hi, Darian. It's Jay Buckley. I have a question. Yeah. Some of the George Catlin paintings of Earth Lodge villages, there's fortifications. You yeah. mentioned that a uh, double ditch may have had some fortifications. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about which villages were fortified, unfortified, and and a little bit about it? Sure. You know, when you when you study that um, that map of Clark, uh, the Clark Maximilian map. You notice that uh, he's got dashed lines around every village on that map. Um, I don't know to the extent of, let's say, the, the lower Hidatsa or the, the second site uh, right next to the, the Knife River, right over here, um, if they were fortified, uh, just because of the way that um, uh, it was settled later on. And uh, there, there might have been areas that were 
were plowed under that that may have been a fortification ditch. Um, Amahami, where Stanton is today, um, not sure on that one either, but certainly when you get down into the Mandan villages, uh, they were fortified. I could see Amahami as having a fortification um, in that the previous village of those people, Molander, uh, had an extensive ditch and fortification uh, around their site. So living here was, I, I keep bringing up the adage of a double-edged sword because everybody knew where you were, um, which meant that uh, you could freely trade and, and uh, bring in commerce and that type of thing. However, everybody knew where you were. So you were subject <laughs> to attack. And, uh, and it goes to uh, my first point of managing your resources in this area because a site like Big Hidatsa, which did have a fortification ditch, started um, in around the early 1600s and, uh, and then was occupied all the way up until 1845. And so if you're in this area thinking about 200 years ago, uh, less trees, because you've got uh, continual fires happening on the prairie. Um, the trees are basically resigned to only the river bottoms and um, you've got 200 trees, make an average lodge there. Um, you've got over 100 lodges in that village, plus a huge fortification wall around that entire village. So you're, you're looking at a lot of work that goes into uh, to establishing a village. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Feel free. Go ahead. Um, hey, so we have a question over here. I'm sorry. I know somebody else might as well, but we're going to have to jump off in a minute. So Maya has a question for you, Darian. Yeah. So I was wondering, the hole through the ceiling, when it rains or snows, what do you guys do for that? OK, so what I do is I press a button, and then, <laughs> and then a motor turns on, and a window goes Oh. Back in the day, um, so we saw that little bull boat in the river um, in that uh, George Catlin painting. So bull boats being the common method of, of uh, water travel around here, but you know they didn't last forever. So as soon as one got uh, a hole in it, wasn't uh, good for, for use in the river anymore, it became a, a handy hole to, or a handy cover to to cover up the smoke hole. So basically kind of prop it up at an angle and let the smoke out. But torrential rains, blizzard, um, they were pretty much covered from, from having their fire going out. Speaking of the fire, um, I realize why they built winter villages. I didn't really get into that topic, but, um, but while I'm on it, um, you'd have to have this thing a uh, roaring bed of coals all day in the winter time. Uh, mm -hmm. There's times when I do open this thing up in February, snow will fall in and I've had snow sitting in the fire pit along the edge for about four hours and it never melted and I've got a fire going in the middle of it. So. That's impressive. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Karen, you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, are you gonna grow some tobacco again this year? I've got a bunch started. You want some? Well, uh, which are you growing the Eastern tobacco or the uh, local tobacco? Yeah, so we've got uh, three species. We've got uh, two native species, um, both documented by, by Lewis um, during the Ricara time. And, um, and so the Nicotiana quadrivalvis and then the Nicotiana rustica, the strong tobacco. And then um, I'm got a flat of the uh, the taller stuff that you've seen before. Um, and I've been actually processing some of that uh, the past couple of weeks with, from what's been grown last fall. So um, I've got a, a pretty decent stock of tobacco right now. Um, give it out to, to elders and um, other uh, tribal members that visit us. And certainly if anybody else uh, requests some, I can and get some out to you. 
Darian, I also have a question about Knife River Flint. You know, you were kind enough to give me a couple of chunks. I gave one to John Fisher yeah. and Bud Clark, and I've got one. How yeah. important was that Knife River Flint to the trade? Let me show you. Um, I've got a little map here uh, to the extent of where you can find that flint today from an, at least an archaeological perspective. And this goes to speak about the, uh, this area as a, as a center of trade. So even before there were people growing um, massive amounts of corn and other produce, you had continual trade in Knife River Flint in this area. And all that flint is sourced from basically this western part of today, North Dakota, into a little bit of eastern Montana. And with that trade, you have it exchanging hands as far south as New Mexico, as far east as uh, upstate New York, um, all for, for just this simple rock, but could easily be turned into something like this here. I did have how many other... people? Oh, how many people would occupy one of the one of the lodges uh, like the one you're standing in? So, an average family in here, um, we're talking with, uh, in a traditional Hidatsa sense, uh, a polygamous society. So, a man who had uh, several wives. The wives uh, normally were sisters of each other. Uh, let's say two or three of those. Um, however many kids might be there, and then the wives. Um, uh, parents. So we're looking at uh, somewhere around the range of 10 to, uh, to a dozen people occupying a lodge like this. Thank you. Yep. So whenever you're looking at a map of, um, of an earth lodge village and, and it does note the number of lodges, uh, just kind of think of multiplying that number by by 10 and you're, you're getting to around the population of each village size. Could you also talk about the symbiotic relationship between the, the maize, the beans and the squash? Yeah. They all grow um, together? I, I've tried it myself as, as kind of a three sisters garden. Um, when we get into Hidatsa agriculture and, uh, and start looking at uh, some of those ways it was done uh, the, the most prominent uh, source you can find that information is Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden. Um, Gilbert Wilson being the author. And uh, there's actually some planting diagrams that, that show alternating rows of, of beans and corn. Um, squash maybe being a row unto itself. And then a border of the garden being sunflowers. And so with, with each village, a family growing a garden had its own garden, you know, the family itself, um, connected to other plots of other families. And an average garden back then, depending on how many people you had and how industrious you were, um, was somewhere between a, an acre to three acres in size. Whoa. So quite a, quite a bit big uh, garden plot. I have a, a hard enough time just doing a 30 by 50 plot right next to the earth lodge here, but. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I have a, I have a comment. Um, having read about a number of the traders that were staying in those villages, it's interesting to read some of their journals that they talk about uh, the chiefs being their landlords, because when these traders stayed in these villages, they would join up with a family in the earth lodge. And uh, it seemed like they had their own little section in an earth lodge and uh, were sure to uh, provide uh, valuable trade goods to their landlord. And I was, I was struck by the fact that they actually used the word landlord as they talked about their hosts. Yeah, and just uh, 
to your point, John, I was thinking of uh, Charles McKenzie, just reading him the other day. And uh, Lewis, you know, coming into these, these villages, and actually this, this village right over here, and uh, trying to uh, figure out who the chief is, which lodge it is, and, and if he's able to come in, uh, the chief totally ignores him. And, uh, and he likens it to an English lord, you know, those who are not home, you know, do not answer the door. And uh, so they're not home. <laughs> and um, yeah, when, if you are coming into this, uh, the lodge and you were welcomed as a visitor, um, I didn't actually show this part of the lodge, but um, your spot in this lodge would probably be, and I'm just getting the camera here so you can take a look at it, um, right next to the fire pit. And it's that uh, nice willow back uh, double recliner there. It's called the Atuka. And it is pretty much the, the place for the guest of honor or uh, the most eldest living in the lodge. So just in your mind, think of uh, somebody from the Northwest Company coming in and all this baggage and trade goods all piled up and, and then getting served a dish of beans and corn and, and that type of thing right here. Anybody else have any questions for Darian? Darian, would you speak to the trade fair that occurred before Lewis and Clark arrived? Yeah, so um, with that, uh, this being the, the center of trade, um, some of those tribes that you could name off the top of your head would be uh, the Crow, especially um, them being a, actually an offset, um, an early offset of the Hidatsa tribe. Um, the Cheyenne, um, early on in the 1800s. Uh, the Assiniboine to a degree. Um, and then even some of those tribes that uh, we normally think of more as a, a Southwestern tribe, uh, they, they were ranging up into this area um, early on in, in the time of these villages. So the Arapaho and the Kiowa uh, were, were making continual visits up here. And then depending on that time of year, remember there's an ebb and flow, a very nuanced uh, approach to it, but you know, uh, possibly a band of Sioux coming in and trading as well. So during the fall of the year, it, it got even more busy and more hectic uh, in this area during the harvest. And all of a sudden a camp of uh, 400 Cheyennes might show up and be camping out right next to the village. And, between the next week, you had uh, trade going on between the two tribes. Anybody else? Boy, Darian, that was really wonderful. I just That's wanted great. to let everybody know before I quit, um, I did record this. And I'll send out the link to it to, um, to just, I guess, I guess I'll just send it out to everybody that I know that's uh, asked me to uh, join this, um, this video session and others that couldn't make it. Well, hey, anybody I else has any more questions? Go ahead. Lots of great Thank information. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Thank you. Yeah, you did great, Darian, thanks. Yes, thank you, Darian. Hey, uh, thank you. And, and on, on behalf of, of everybody with the, the Trail Heritage Foundation, um, thank you for the opportunity to, to be uh, with you tonight and to share some information on the, the MHA Nation and, and their rich culture and history. And uh, I miss everybody in Great Falls. Um, and elsewhere in the country, whether it be uh, Lewiston or down in Florida. So thank you all for joining me all across the country. <laughs>